Today's forum is part two of the Columbus Metropolitan Club's Game Changers series, Robot Revolution, is presented in partnership with the Columbus Idea Foundry with a special thanks to the mascot organization at, and Adam Bonner for the welcoming robot today. So let's give them all a hand. Robots have been changing our lives for decades. From thermostats and dishwashers to automated manufacturing, robotics technology, including artificial intelligence, is rapidly progressing. So much so that the line between humans and robots grows ever smaller. We can only begin to imagine the possibilities. Thus, our panel of robot experts and deep thinkers today. Please welcome Hugo Beltran, Associate Chief Engineer, Honda North American Services, LLC, Yan, Yan Zing, Wynn Bigler Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering of The Ohio State University, Gary Milosevic, Retired VP of Research and Development, Owens Corning, and host and moderator, Dan Moshalko, general manager, WCBE, and host of the Amazing Science Emporium. Dan, the floor is yours. Take it away. All right, thanks, Bill. You know, robots, whether you realize it or not, are becoming so ubiquitous that the time is not going to be far off when you're going to be holding on for the big President's Day sale to get a robot at the lowest price possible at Walmart. And actually, I was checking for a robot sale just yesterday at Meyer. That's how ubiquitous they are. I was going in for milk and Ovaltine. The secret is out. So, um, But I went over and I saw a robot display over by the small appliances division. There were three different models of Roombas there. All highly specialized machines designed to do specific tasks that humans would do. And that, in the bottom line, is what a robot really is. Now, wow, what a difference from the first robot I ever met. When I was six years old, back in 1965, I discovered on the floor, mangled in the corner of my classroom, this copy of Lester Del Rey's book, the runaway robot. And I fell in love with Rex immediately, the star robot. He was the defender, the servant of a kid on a moon around Saturn. The kid was, I think, kidnapped. You gotta remember, this was a long time ago. But the kid fell into some kind of danger, and you know, Rex ended up by the end of the book coming through and saving the kid. How could I not love Rex? But like all matters of the heart, my robot love was fickle. For within a few short weeks, that brilliant futurist Erwin Allen debuted Lost in Space. And there, there, <laughs> my heart turned to Will Robinson's beloved B9. KB9, I got this one. <sighs> My little friend. Well, the point of today's discussion is to go beyond the sci-fi romance and find out what is the robot reality, both of today and tomorrow. These gentlemen are uniquely qualified to tell us all about that. And I'll start with Hugo on the far end from Honda, well known for its use of robotics, and I want to find out at this very moment, not projecting forward, not going to the past, but today, while we're eating here, how are you using robots at Honda? Um, well, first, thank you for inviting us to join today. Um, we use robotics for welding, for painting. We use it on an assembly line to mount very heavy pieces of equipment to the, to the car, like the engine, suspension. So it's embedded throughout all our companies. Currently in North America, we use over 5,000 robots. In Ohio, over 2,500 robots are running. And we can, we're planning to expand even more. 
and that area. So they're helping us dramatically. So 2,500 robots yeah. already. Yeah, here in Ohio, 5,000 in North America. Yeah, and just to make it clear too, I should have done this at the very beginning. Hugo, what exactly is your title with Honda? I'm an associate chief engineer. Okay. And Yuan, what exactly is, what do you do? Uh, I have been doing robotics research for more than 30 years. Actually, in 1979, I came to the United States from China, joined Ohio State. And since that time, I have been working on, res on, on research on robotics. So I almost. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so Obviously, robots aren't completely behavior. You know. <laughs> so I, I could say I witnessed the, the development of robotics uh, technology in this industry in the last 35 years. Uh, in fact, a robot, the first robot was invented in the United States in 1960s by a fellow, his last name is Edinburgh, and the people in our field call him the father of robot. Actually, I should be uh, in, in 2004, honored him as uh, give him the Pioneer Award in the robotics. So today, I would say the situation, people, expectation, very much like in the early 80s. Early 80s, people believe robot can do anything and I remember National Science Foundation program director wrote articles, say robots is coming, robot is coming. Then due to the obstacles, by the way, the critical components of a robot, motor, AC motor or DC motor, uh, speed reducer, people use harmonic driver a lot of time, then battery, if that robot wants to be autonomous, stay alone. And most important is the computing power. And in the 80s, these were not there yet. And today, after 30 years, all those crit critical components, the cost, the performance, the cost dropped dramatically, the performance improved dramatically. Therefore, people in every sector push for robotics at a very low cost, like a Rambo. Today, you can spend $300, dollars $500 for such, uh, say, floor cleaner. But 30 years ago, it could cost $15,000. Nobody could afford it, right? And uh, anybody knows what is the name of a company producing Rumble? Go, go back to your, to your office to type iRobot, a company called iRobot. <laughs> and actually formed by a uh, professor of MIT. And uh, his name is Ronnie Brook. Uh, he has been very successful to identify a so-called killing application in our daily life, which can use robots. So the Rambo, the vacuum cleaner, so simple, but it needs robotics technology at such a low cost. Therefore, first robotics company so-called service robot, not an industrial robot, to become very successful. Actually, if we end up having more time at the end, I want to explore whether or not the idea of literally having a killer app in a robot yeah, yeah. will end up being a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> you, said you mean a killer? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm talking about a killing application means a very successful application to push the robotics technology to our daily life. So Rambo robot is a, a very good example. Excellent. And in the future, because of the reasons I just mentioned, the computing, artificial intelligence, the lower cost of those uh, critical components, so more areas people will push for robotics to our daily life, in addition to industrial robots, also the so-called service robots. So in the future, you will see robots everywhere. For example, unfortunately, I do not want to offend those uh, uh, gent uh, ladies and gentlemen bring our dishes. And in the future, robots could be in our room to bring all the food for us. Okay, I, I, I think I said too long. I should no, stop. that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot. Um, let's move to Gary then, Gary. Yeah, so I started, uh, I started my career in 1984 uh, working in the nuclear industry, developing robotics for remote handling and reducing radiation exposure workers. In, in a couple of areas, uh, there were standard tasks that we had to do at the Department of Energy for sampling materials that was in production. 
Uh, and you, do, you used to have to do that with people. And we developed automated systems to go and do that uh, automatically. And then you had the response issue. So if you had an incident or an accident, so a three mile island type in event, what would you do in the event of an accident like that? How would you respond where you couldn't put people in harm's way? So we did a lot of work and it was interesting because at the time, and this is 1984, you couldn't go to the robot store and buy what you needed. Uh, today, the Cougar Robotics team could go over to Micro Center and buy a lot of the components that they use, or you can go to the local hobby shop and get a Lego Mindstorm. Back then, none of that existed. Uh, so all the software had to be written, the electronics had to be designed, the mechanical systems had to be designed, which made it really exciting work for a young engineer just out of college. Uh, I, I continue to be amazed by the progress that's occurred over the last 30 years in, um, in cost, as, as Juan mentioned. Uh, we built a six-legged walking robot in 1986. It was well over a million dollars. Uh, each of the legs was controlled by, at the time, something called a Motorola 68000 processor. Most of you remember that as the original Macintosh was driven by that, so the equivalent of six Macintoshes to run each of the legs, and then another Macintosh sitting there to tell the legs what to do. Uh, but it was still fascinating. This is a robot that could get itself narrow enough to walk through a door and yet spread its legs far enough apart that it could pick the back of a pickup truck off the ground. And the reason it was developed is in the case of, of an accident scenario, you might have piping that had fallen down or walls or rubble or whatever and tracked vehicles or wheeled vehicles, you just couldn't use in an environment like that. And, to the, and you would instead with a walking machine be able to walk upstairs or over those types of obstacles to get in and, and do what needed to be done. Well, everybody, Yohan actually stated it the most bluntly, but it's all really revolving around an aspect of service, servitude, whether it's public service in the household, in the factory. And there's a little irony in there because the very name robot implies that. I don't know, you know, melding arts and sciences, but the term robot was born in 1920 when Czech playwright Karl Chopik, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name properly, but he credits his brother Joseph with actually coming up with the name. He had a massive writer's block when it came to that part of the play. But it comes from the Czech term robotnik, which ultimately means a slave or an indentured servant. So the fact that way back in 1920, Chapek was already seeing that implication, it's very prescient. But given that, given that, that aspect of servitude, how do you think robots are going to impact our lives as they develop? And let's go in the same order then so we can kind of cover the same territory. Industrially, factories, you know, factory workers. As we continue to apply robotics in the, in, the, in the automotive industry, for us, it's going to make it more efficient. At the same time, I think part of the challenge is we have to have the right people to keep them running. So the skills required to do that is going to be a high, higher level. So those are, so those are some of the things we're looking at. Um, you know, we're right now, currently installing glass. Robots are going to be, even right as we talk about today, basically taking uh, automatic pictures, offsetting themselves to set the, uh, the parts correctly. Uh, ins and inspecting quality, looking for deforms and so forth, so we can send quality products uh, out of our door every time, guaranteed. So those are some of the things that we're looking at and currently working on. When we were eating, you would also mention you know, the actual benefits to the labor force. When I, I was younger and robots were first becoming in industrial use, there were a lot of, well, unions you know, were complaining that robots were going to put humans out of work. Um, but it doesn't seem to have worked out that way. I mean, how, how does it help at Honda? I can tell you, at Honda, the jobs have changed to be more, maybe more complex. We do a lot more CATIA. We do a lot more value-added engineering. Some of the things, just welding a, a servo gun or a gun and very, very manual, very physical, we're trying to simplify that by using a robot, by using our associates to, hire, to work in the higher skilled areas. So there's, that's why we're using that moving forward. Yeah, and that you were saying, too, there's, there's like a dearth now of robotic technicians. So kind of moving from the assembly line yeah, so that's one of the, you know, I've been in robotics for over 30 years, and how do you keep a robot running all the time so it doesn't fail? Because every time it fails, you have loss. So that's one of the things we're working at Honda. And one of the things we're doing here in Ohio, actually we're building two training centers, one in Anna for a powertrain, and we're building another one for the auto side in Marysville. And it's going to be simulating the actual floor. We're going to have an actual welding line. We're going to have an assembly line and a small paint line so we can train our associates, engineers, 
technicians, operators, as well as associates. And they're, how can they keep this equipment, more complex equipment, running reliably? So we have to invest in that, our associates. Okay, Gary, you know, since the six-legged robot take us out of the factory, and, and how do you see mechanical labor having its application outside of manufacturing? So I think a good example is, um, I think everyone in the room has probably heard of minimally invasive surgery. Uh, most people have, uh, associate that with laparoscopic surgery, but you can go one step further, and uh, here in Ohio we have the Da Vinci surgical robot. Uh, maybe a little bit of a misnomer. Robot generally implies that it's something that's autonomous and follows a program path, and, and the Da Vinci robot certainly is not operating in you autonomously. What it is doing, however, is uh, taking the skills of the surgeon and we call it tele teleoperation, but allowing the surgeon to make very, very fine moves inside the human body without having to make large incisions as you would have in traditional surgery. So now you can move your hands in, in a way that's comfortable for you, but down at the level of the instruments, they're moving in just millimeters of movement, so you can get very precise movement and yet be able to do that with 3D stereo stereoscopic vision. Not a huge leap of imagination to take that one step further and say, you've got a very skilled physician that's in Columbus, uh, but you've been in an auto accident in Cleveland and you don't have access to that skill set. He could walk into a suite where he is looking just like he would be in the operating room, except the operating room is 150 miles away. Uh, and so now it starts thinking about how do I bring uh, skilled medicine to developing areas or areas that are underserved by medical capabilities. Just one example of, of what's, uh, what's right around the corner. It's a literal lifesaver. Yeah. Yohan, what about other aspects of how might robots end up affecting our day-to-day -day li day lives beyond the Roomba? Yeah, I, and I think in the service robots uh, sector, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of potentials uh, robots can help us. But uh, I would say robots will never be able to replace human beings. Uh, only can help us in some simple jobs, repetitive jobs, and uh, in some jobs which are dangerous. For example, like a nuclear power plant uh, incident three years ago, and, uh, you cannot send people in, and you have to send the robots. And uh, some, sometimes uh, maybe terrorists put a bomb in some environment, then you send the robot in. Then, just like uh, in, the, in the computing, computer now is more and more powerful to process the data, to store the data, but the computer can never make a decision for you. So you have to make uh, critical decisions and the important things human beings still have to be involved. So just like robots, again, only can replace very simple jobs. And uh, in, my, in my laboratory right now, for example, we are developing an autonomous uh, wheelchairs for help uh, patients and the elderly people and sometimes they could not even uh, manipulate uh, the wheelchair. Then the robots using the sensors can take him or her from one place to another place. Then you don't need a nurse, you don't need a lot of people to push. And as uh, the society is becoming older and this kind of wheelchair will have a lot of potentials. Again, replace human beings, help human beings for those simple repetitive jobs but not for complicated jobs. Complicated jobs still need people. This is one thing. Another point, because I have been involved in research, and I don't put the expectation too high. <laughs> and it takes a long time, really, to make a robot can meet the killing applications everybody can see in our society. I'd like okay. to add something to it. You know, Honda, I don't know if you guys heard of ASIMO. We have an ASIMO robot. And that, you know, right now, we're trying to teach them autonomy. Uh, we're working uh, with a museum in Japan, and he's there trying to learn from autonomy. There are people are waving, and he's taking that signal back and processing that. Uh, so that's something that we're doing. The other thing Yuan uh, uh, talked about was also Honda's developing walk assist. So as you get older, we can have strap these walk assists so we can move and be mobile. So those are some of the things that are kind of in the future that we're working on today to develop that technology. Yeah, yeah in a lot of ways, it seems like the sci-fi of yesterday really is becoming true now. So let's, let's take a moment. We only have a few minutes left before the Q&A session um, to actually project out into the future. And one of the things, partly because of my own academic background, one of my old professors is working on research in quantum computing. 
which seems like as far as artificial intelligence has gone already, like you were talking about recognizing the hand waving, I've read about other systems that are trying to recognize facial expressions, and not only so that you can be more comfortable with the robot, because that's how humans are, we respond to that facial expression. So if a robot can respond to you that way, that's great, but also for psychiatric applications, where its efficacy has actually so far been pretty good. So in that response aspect, you know, teaching computers to be even more autonomous, have more, for lack of a better term, thought. Um, where are we headed? Are we gonna need things like embedding in the core CPU Asimov's three laws of robotics? Does everybody remember the three laws? Does somebody wanna to volunteer to shout them out? <laughs> I'll take them from here. I wrote them down so I can get them exact. Rule number one, a robot may not injure a human being or, through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Two, a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings except where such orders violate the first law. And three, a robot must protect its own existence, good economic rule in that one, as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. Now. I'll go back to Hugo for this one. Was Asimov prescient? Are, are we gonna get to a point where AI is sophisticated enough where we'll have to have those laws in there as a safety code? I think time will tell. I think we're progressing that way. Uh, but in the immediate future, what we need from robotics is, you know, like, just like myself, I go to a doctor, he measures my, my height, my weight, and he tells me, Hugo, you need to do more exercise, eat healthier. So that's what we need from robots. We want them to tell us, you know what, I'm starting to wear out. I need to be maintained, I need to do, you need to come take care of me. That's, that's the future. Currently, we're working with many robotics companies. We call that predictive or proactive. That's what we need to go to make sure that robots are efficient going forward, because right now, they'll fail, fail crisis tropically, and then we have to have high skilled workforce to go and repair them, and that's law. So that's kind of the future that we're working currently in. And let me hop over to Gary. How do you, again, because you had an industrial background, and now you're. Yeah, I think the one that's, that's right on the, the horizon right now are self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. Google's already got some out there. DARPA's done the grand challenge, so they've had these vehicles drive across the desert 150 miles. So what implications does that have? How comfortable would anybody in this room feel like hopping in your car and having it take you from point A to point B? The idea is very attractive. Um, yeah, I'm going to have trouble when my daughter's driving the car in a minute. Well, and you worry about everybody else on the road, so your car may be smart, but maybe theirs isn't. Uh, so it's going to be it's going to be an interesting transition because technology, uh, you know, the telematics that are in vehicles today, between being able to talk on the phone, stream video to the kids in the back seat, have the navigation system sending you somewhere, making restaurant reservations, and oh by the way, when you get there, you don't know how to parallel park. You just push a button, and the car parallel parks itself. It's not a huge step to say how much further are you going to have in automation? What implications does that have around how do you protect the vehicle's occupants? Mm -hmm. How do you protect the vehicle? How do you protect property around it? So we've got the Star Wars medical droid. <laughs> we've got, you know, smart cars. Yuan, what are you seeing coming down <clears throat> in the future? Uh, in the future, I would say the human or robots. Human or robots. The robot looks like a human being, structured like a human being, where we present the future. Uh, I have brought uh, one small one, I just mentioned. In my lab, I also have a big human-sized robot, human or robot. I believe Honda was the first industry developing a human-sized robot for about 20 years already. Yep. 86. 86, so more than 20 years. In fact, the uh, uh, United States federal government, DOD, sponsored a uh, human or robot challenge and right now still going on. In December, two months ago, three months ago, there was a pre-trial in human world robot competition. And this, uh, this year in December will be the final competition. The winner will win $2 million a prize. Wow. And uh, also open to uh, worldwide, every university company, they can participate right now eight, uh, after the first try, eight uh, uh, teams will continue to be sponsored by DARPA. And Ohio State also participated in the competition. I was in Miami in December. So 
Rapa in the DOD fears that uh, our environment mostly originally created for human beings. Therefore, robots look, behave like human beings, can have the most use. So this is the reason push for human robots. And uh, in the future, human robots will more and more become a reality, take some time. Then we cannot tell any difference between robots and human beings. <laughs> <laughs> All right, in just a few minutes, um, we're going to go to a Q&A so you can ask about the utopian or dystopian state of robots today and tomorrow. Um, but before we get to that, just I wanted a, a one final opportunity so you could just tell us what's on your mind about robots. What's, what geeks you about robotics right now? I, I think th for me is the robots can do a job repetitive then you know, many times a human gets tired of doing repetitive motion, that we can use the, or human mind to do more value-added things. That, to me, I think is something that's very valuable. So a nice supplement to that's right. humanity. Johan? Yeah, robotics to me is an integration of many supporting technologies. So the robotics technology of one country reflects actually the advancement of other technologies in this country. From hardware, I just mentioned the critical components to soft software, artificial intelligence, long-time programming. So robots booming actually really is something very good for technologies. And pushing, on the other hand, pushing those supporting technologies to become even better. Excellent. And Gary? I think one of the things that excites me is the uh, cause and effect relationship as it relates to young folks in education. Uh, you've, you'll be able to see in the back what the Cougar Robotics team has done. It's work that, that I wasn't doing as a senior in college in robotics. Um, I'm mentoring a, a group with DeSales High School right now who's working against the MIT Prize competition to develop a machine to turn the pages of a book for someone who's handicapped and can't do that themselves. They're doing mathematics that, that I did in my junior or senior year in college. They're doing it in their sophomore year of high school. So it helps propagate STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in, in ways that you wouldn't have predicted ahead of time, but it gets that involvement um, that, that now will give us a set of uh, skill sets for the future that the U.S. has been lagging in, if you read any of the popular press around engineering, science, and where we fall versus the rest of the world. I think this can be a way that it, it's a focus where kids can get excited, uh, you get some immediate gratification, and you don't realize you're learning until you've actually learned something. Yeah. Well, I've got one last round of questions for you, and that really gets highly speculative now. And I want you to get in touch with the purely human part of you. And that is the dystopian vision of the future. You know, we're getting comfortable with the technology, but more than once in the past, technology has turned around not been used in the way we were wanting it to be used as it was being developed. So in the dystopian vision of robotics, we've got things like the Terminator, um, Colossus the Foreman Project, you know, where a computer to protect us takes away all our freedoms. Um, are we at any danger of that kind of, I, I hesitate to label it unforeseen because I'm asking you to foresee it, but you know, are there any safeguards? Are, are, is robotics the type of technology where we can just go ahead and just develop it and it'll take care of itself? Or do we need to worry that at some point the machines might get the upper hand? We'll go in reverse order. Gary. Interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if, if you look at the current environment, uh, you know, robots can be very dangerous. If you're in an assembly line and a wire breaks and it can move out of its work envelope, if you haven't guarded or kept uh, workers out of the area, they, they can be hurt or maimed or killed. So that exists today and you use engineering controls around that. Um, to go more to your dystopian enterprise, I think first of all you have to have that level of sentient intelligence that we've not reached yet and it's a very interesting philosophical debate if we will ever be able to develop that. Uh, but if that were the case, yeah, that might be something to be worried about. But I think Hollywood does a better job of that than, uh, than maybe technology does at this point. So I think shouldn't take James Cameron as a science expert. No. This stuff. Okay. But very entertaining movies. <laughs> <laughs> you on. Uh, 
uh, I would say uh, robots will never hurt human beings unless human beings wants to use robots to, heal, to, heal, uh, to hurt other human beings because the robots are always controlled by human beings and by people. In the, the movie, we see something, robots become so powerful, I, I don't think that it would happen because the machine created by people, then people, of course, can control the, control the machine, control the robots. In fact, uh, the reason why DOD is so interested in robotics is because uh, robotics could, uh, robots could uh, replace soldiers and they could, go, could go to uh, very difficult environments without a lot of people uh, killed, for example. In fact, I'd like, like to mention another company is called Boston Dynamics. Boston Dynamics, the big dog, have you ever heard of The big dog, a huge robot with four legs, and it can climb the mountain completely, almost autonomous, very powerful. Actually, the uh, Def Department of Defense is uh, considering to use it right now. If you go to YouTube, type in Boston Dynamics, you will see this kind of robot. So help the country to save people. Okay, don't sort of send so many young people in, in, in the front line, and that uh, could help. Robots killing people auto autonomously, voluntarily, that will never happen, I want to say. So B9 will always be my friend. I, like that. I agree with uh, you. One of the things that I think about, though, is we have to build in the safety algorithms to make sure they're there. You know, even today, as we use robots, I think you, we're talking about, Gary was talking about robots, if you, not, if you don't use them correctly, you know, we have teach pendants that we move robots, and if you don't use it correctly, you can create damage, you can hurt people. Mm -hmm. So as companies, we have to put those procedures, uh, lock out, tag out, and how to use, teach people how to use these very powerful devices uh, so we don't hurt others. But I think it's uh, probably won't happen, but we have to put those algorithms in, in place. Right. My geek soul will be assuaged as long as those algorithms are there. That's right. Well, it's CMC's tradition to take audience questions. So if you have a question for our panel, please go to the microphone. It's over there by the big spotlight and table. Uh, state your name, and then ask your question, and we thank you in advance for avoiding long editorial comments, particularly the dystopian ones. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello. Um, Kimberly Gibson, EWI. Um, my question is, we've seen, ro we've, we already know that robots are being used for space exploration, uh, particularly Mars. Um, they tend to be little crafts that roam around with cameras and things. With the um, ability to do quantum computing and artificial intelligence technologies advancing, do you see the opportunity for robots to help us with deep space exploration, uh, other galaxies, and um, yeah? <laughs> Who wants to tackle that? <laughs> Replacing human explorers in deep space. We haven't had any human explorers in deep space yet. Wow. So it, you know, as you think about it, all the missions that we've had that have even gone outside our own, uh, our own little ring of eight slash nine planets um, have been fairly unintelligent because of the technology at the time. Uh, but certainly as you think about uh, the current missions they're talking about for Mars, which will have much more sophisticated uh, rovers as opposed to the little guys. Uh, and they will be able to do analysis. Uh, they'll be able to do data reduction. They'll be able to draw some conclusions and send those back. And as you think about it, communications with Mars, I think, is about seven minutes round trip, seven to 11 minutes, something like that, depending where it is in its orbit. So it's not one of those things that you can give it a command, and it's not like you're, you're steering the sumo bots in the back. It certainly has to have some level of autonomous if it's going to be efficient. Uh, discovery, curiosity could move a couple of feet a day. Uh, and if you really want to do a mass exploration, you've got to be able to move a lot more with, from that. So there has to be a set of rules, as Hugo mentioned, that it kind of knows what it's allowed to do, and it can kind of go off and do that. Um, a lot of that relies on battery power, to have enough power to, to drive a bigger vehicle, and the ability to collect and generate that power. Uh, so solar cell efficiency, one of the things that we continue to pursue here uh, on Earth for generating electricity for our own uses is incredibly important when you're out in uh, either planetary exploration or deep space exploration, because there's just so little light and so little energy you can gather, and so the energy budgets for these things are like a 100 watt light bulb in your house is what they have to operate on. And that's, oh, by the way, to deal with it being minus 250 <laughs> degrees. Uh, 
you know, outside temperatures. So being able to keep the electronics working and all that and still be able to move and, and do the judgment and run a, a good sized computer is an interesting task. I think we will get there. Um, but first, you know, we got to get the autonomous robot going. As I mentioned, Honda's working with the National Museum of Emerging in Science and Innovation in, J in Japan to get that autonomous capability. The other thing, I think, the power source. That's a must. We need to figure out a power source. I don't know that batteries will be there, you know, but we have to find the right power source to energize the robots to achieve that. Yeah, I could leapfrog on that real quick, quickly. Um, what about the uses of making other planets more human friendly, or possibly Earth if it gets too messed up with climate change? Uh, could robots be used to help us with things like terraforming, improving environment, you know, going more on the machines helping on the bio side? Already, Honda is working on robots to help us to do some cleanup and do and do things. We're doing that today already, but by remote control. So just add that autonomous factor, and that's right. Off they go. Okay, Bill. Hi, Bill Lafayette. Um, as an economist, one of the things that I think about very hard is workforce development, and I'm just wondering if any of you have any thoughts about, especially lower skill workers how we can equip them to uh, uh, interface with this new world of automation and robots rather than being replaced by it. Yeah, I'd like to respond because uh, I'm a professor in the education field. I think uh, for the future, any kids preparing, they have to receive adequate education. And uh, I visited uh, FNAC Robotics uh, in Japan uh, four or five years, years ago. And uh, FNAC Robotics now is the major company producing robots. And of their employees, more than 80%, more than 80% uh, receive at least a bachelor degree. So low-skilled laborers, they do not need so many. And uh, in, the, in the workshop, uh, in the machine shop, they use robots to, rep to replace the labels. They use robots to assemble the robots, to produce the parts. Mm -hmm. So you go to uh, a factory, a shop, you do not see many people. So for the low skill laborers, uh, I think uh, we are all responsible to give them as much education as possible. Mm -hmm. If they, for example, recruited by Honda, then Honda, I'm sure they're willing to let them go through some training process, get the basic technologies, how to interact, use the robots. That is the minimum to me. I think we have to do a better job of promoting STEM. And when I talk about STEM, it's like Honda currently, we have a lot of openings and it's difficult to find those young members, young uh, associates that want to come and join the manufacturing. They don't understand the high tech. And one of the things we're doing, so we're partnering up with like Columbus State, Marion Technical College, Edison Community College, and Rhodes State to develop those programs and working with them to prepare those uh, people when they graduate there, they can come and work for Honda with us. Yeah, I think the, I think the day of uh, believing that I can graduate high school with a high school diploma and I'm going to have a high paying role in a high tech industry is probably gone. Uh, the requirement for most organizations now is a minimum two-year bachelor's degree, um, associates or a bachelor's degree, and that kind of is what is the minimum entry now to get into some of these high-tech roles. So you're no longer going to go into Honda as a welder, as Hugo and I were talking about at lunch. You'll go in as a robotics technician who's maintaining the equipment that does the welding, and you'll see that across many industries. Um, there's even a lot of work today in developing automation for the construction industry. So how do you either factory build panelized sections for residential homes? How do you have robotics doing the welding on more industrial or uh, commercial skyscrapers? So that we used to be the old iron bending, wood cutting, those kinds of skills are being supplanted with a higher thinking level. And it's interesting, if you look at your, your cellular phone, it's a very sophisticated computer that has a very simple user interface. So you're taking something that virtually a, a child can play with and use, they don't have to know how it works, but they do know how to use it. So we have to build that ability to translate those kinds of skills into other areas, but it does require that strong science technology background 
it's not going to be okay to kind of float through and then say, okay, where's my, my good paying job? And this is shameless plug time. This is where it pays to come to as many CMC forums as possible. Because I think it was about a month ago, there was a CMC forum about school districts, one of the grant initiatives that the state's offering to schools that are being innovative. And Marysville Schools came up, was one of the people represented, one of the organizations represented. And they talked about this very issue with Honda. And that's motivating them to try to get their own vocational programs up to snuff. And I, I believe they're actually retrofitting a, a old building they haven't been using so that they can have these educational programs on the tech side. So, and then on the personal level, I was also, I like to see in the CMC spirit, the big picture, what the ripple effects are of things. And I was having lunch with a business professor um, Monday morning. And he, to my amazement, didn't balk at having a meal with a geek. Um, I just didn't think the two worlds were, were going to mesh. But they did. He listened eagerly as I you know, got on my soapbox about STEM, about science and literacy, about how difficult I think it's going to be for the U.S. to really be a truly strong power if we don't have a literate public. And he agreed. He said he's seeing it in the business world, not so much from the things you'd expect as far as you know, new research, R&D coming down the pike, but the very fundamentals behind STEM, and that's the ability to think critically. You have to be able to look at data, leave your emotions out of it to see what the reality is. And STEM teaches you that. If you don't have that critical thinking ability, you're not going to make good business decisions either. And he ran through a whole litany of companies who've made mistakes that he traces directly to the fact that we are no not longer a nation that knows how to think critically. So thanks, Bill. Ended up being a much more impactful question than you thought. John. Uh, yes, my name is John McKnight. I work for Rife's Auto Body here in Columbus. And uh, two questions, if I may. Um, so when I was a kid, this was a robot. Um, th this is Fred the robot. I built him last night from the same erector set that I used to build robots when I was, you know, 10 years old. Um, logo on his side there? It, it is, ah, yes. <laughs> that's, that's just for you, Dan. I like your robot. Um, today, robots for kids are the ones that are like the ones back there in the back. Given in just a, you know, 30 to 40 year period of time, the advancement in technology from you know, from this to that, and that there are, you know, robotically powered cars, um, a robot can intelligently compete uh, on Jeopardy. It seems inevitable to me that a robot's going to be able to become intelligent, self-thinking, and things like that. So first question, is there something inherent in technology that I don't understand that's gonna prevent that from happening? Because it seems like even though we don't understand how, it seems like it's gonna happen, that, you know, they're gonna get smart, they're gonna have the ability to take over if we let them. Second question is, um, I work in the collision repair field. Robots are being used in the manufacturing of cars. How long is it before uh, the technology is going to be affordable enough that robots are going to be able to, uh, you know, be used on a regular basis in the repair uh, of automotives? Thank you. All right. Who'd like to tackle first? Okay, very quickly. Uh, if you want the robot to behave like a human beings, then you need a robot to have a human brain. But unfortunately, we still don't know our, our own brain, how it works. Actually, a, a few years ago, MIT formed the Brain Research Institute and studied how our brain works. Computing works in totally different way as our brain. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Deep Blue played chess with the international chess champion and. Uh, uh, after a few tries, Deep Blue uh, won eventually. But uh, the mechanism <coughs> totally different. The Big Blue use a huge storage space, use very fast uh, computing to retrieve you all the possibilities. When a human being makes a move, then the computer searches all the space to see following this move, what will be next. Then sort all the possibilities, this is the possibility I will win, then it takes this step. Human beings do not work in this way, the brain. And almost instantly, I, I move this. So before we really know how human brain works, 
how the artificial intelligence really very close to natural intelligence, then we still have a lot of work to do in robotics. This is my point of view. You know, I, I was in uh, Pulse 2014 with IBM a couple of weeks ago, and I talked about Watson. I, I think you referred to Watson working and uh, competing in Jeopardy. Uh, I we're talking about how can we use Watson in the manufacturing environment. We talked about many times we have to figure out how do you troubleshoot that these are the symptoms, how do you analyze them, so that this is one of the things we're working w with IBM to provide that feedback. We talked about collision repair. Uh, currently, you could probably use some of the technology, take a picture, digitize it, have the analysis done. This part is worthwhile repairing or it's too costly, just go ahead and replace it. Uh, and then there's different, you can use robots depending if, if you have a repetitive thing that you do, you have a robot, for example, MIG weld or arc weld, so forth, so. Yeah, I think Hugo hit on one of the keys and that's the repetitiveness. One of the most difficult things for a robot to do is something that's very simple for you or I to do and that's to put a bolt in a hole. Sounds like it should be pretty easy. Turns out it's an incredibly difficult task. Um, so you start thinking about something that's a totally random uh, line of work like collision repair. Uh, to have a robot that can deal with deformed structures, fasteners all over the place, uh, plastic clips, broken parts, broken glass, probably not very likely. Uh, but certainly if you start thinking about the metrology about how do I want to pull that body back into alignment, that would be an ideal one for a robot because you know where the points on the body are, where they need to be, and it can measure how it's moving the structure back into shape. So there, there are, it could be done today, except I think it would be quite expensive. Mm -hmm. So it's how do you get over that cost curve that is somebody going to spend a half a million dollars for a straightening machine? Uh, maybe not. When it gets to $30,000, probably see one in every body shop. And I think that was, I would add, you know, if you're constantly having to repair windshields and front or rear, we have that automation already done. It's already working. We take a picture, three-dimensional, and we can guide the robot to set that up. And, and, and remote, if you've watched their a TV ad lately for Safe Flight, they now have a set of suction cups that they put on the side window of the car that allows a single person to now position your windshield into place. It's not robotic, but it's an aid that would have taken two people on a service call that they're doing with one now. So a very simple solution to a fairly difficult or an expensive problem. All right, we're just about out of time, so one more question. Jack. Yes, Jack Marchbanks. I wanted to ask uh, the panel re in regard to the demographics of the developed world, aging population, particularly when we're talking about service robots and humanoid robots. How far away are we from having robots who can assist the elderly, the infirm, uh, in routine health care and repetitive uh, actions that have to be done to assist the elderly? Uh, I probably hope to live long enough to have a robot take care of me when I get older. <laughs> I guess let me start. So with Asimo, we're do doing already. That's one of the things that we're really working on, having that autonomous. And that's one of the key research activities we're doing. The other thing we already have, we have walk assist already. We have them and you can purchase them. So that's something that we're working on the, for the disabled and elderly, also the people that are recuperating. And what else you want? Yes. I visited many countries in 2004, uh, participating in uh, U.S. delegation investigate uh, robotics technology at that time, 10 years ago. Uh, European aging and uh, United States, of course, a uh, lot of research laboratory already started to do the work. Service robots uh, help elderly people, help the patients, for example. Then after 10 years today, uh, Hugo just mentioned that some technologies, applications, Already, already available. I think uh, very much depends on your expectations. And uh, say some simple help, like uh, autonomous uh, wheelchair, for today some products are already available if you can afford. But uh, your expectation very low cost, uh, the cost as uh, low as just a regular chair, a few hundred dollars, probably you still have to wait for a few more years. And if you want to have a robot uh, can do anything, like a nurse, then probably you have to wait for another 10 years. But uh, gradually raise your expectation, then something already available here. All right, Bill, looks like you're chopping at the bit, so I don't turn the mic back <laughs> to you. Well, thank you, Dan. I hope you all enjoyed today's forum. 
Uh, please remember that you can see it again on Columbus TV3, on the Ohio Channel, on WOSU, and share it on YouTube through CMC's website. We encourage you to care, continue the conversation out in the lobby today over coffee and cookies. Once more, let's recognize our partners, the Columbus Idea Foundry, and thank our speakers, Hugo Beltran, Jan Zing, Gary Milosevic, and Dan Michalko.